Then the Lord God said, it's not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every beast of the fields. But for the man, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they would become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. May God bless the reading of his words. So in chapter 1 of Genesis, God made everything. It was all good. Everything was according to God's perfect plan by the perfect God. The universe He has made, the world He had made, every, the people He had made in His image and likeness. It was all perfectly good. God placed the man in the Garden of Eden, the perfect paradise, where man could enjoy God's presence and His fellowship forever and ever a place of extreme beauty and life-giving fruit. And today we're going to continue on in Genesis chapter 2. We're looking at the covenant of marriage. Because as we read this morning, the only thing that was not good in God's perfect world was that man, Adam, was without a wife. So in our passage, God establishes this covenant of marriage as a way for most people to have relational intimacy and all these needs met by God. Let me give you a couple of verses. Proverbs 18, 22 says this, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor or blessing from the Lord. Proverbs 19, 4, House and wealth are inherited from fathers, but a prudent or wise wife is from the Lord. A wife is a gift from God. Now, I recognize even in this room, there are people from a variety of different life experiences. Some may be very much longing to be married. Others may be longing to be single. Some of your marriages are just getting into a very, very sweet and nice spot Others, if you are just so busy that you're living day to day, your marriage is just, you know, hanging on there, just trying to get through the day. Some may have lost a spouse. Some may be divorced. Some may be married to an unbeliever. Some may have been hurt very deeply by a spouse. And though I cannot speak directly to everybody's situation I need you to understand that this message is not intended to be a five-step process to have a better marriage, although God may certainly do that in your hearts, but no matter where you find yourself this morning with regards to marriage, you need to understand this message is for you, that as you open yourself up to God, the Holy Spirit will use His Word and apply it to your heart and His, in your life in a way that is perfectly fit for you. This is because the human marriage covenant, it ultimately points us to a greater fulfillment in knowing Christ and becoming the bride of Christ through faith. And together with the rest of the church, we are anticipating the consummation of our marriage to Christ one day, where He's going to come back to take us up to the marriage supper of the Lamb, 
together with His church, this is what all of history, a redemptive history, is pointing us towards. Whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you're widowed, whether you're divorced, marriage is all pointing us to the perfect marriage one day, to the perfect husband, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the reality for every single Christian. So as we go through the first marriage in Genesis chapter 2, here's her outline. Man's problem, verse 18a, God's solution, 18b to 23, and then God's covenant of marriage, verse 24 and 25. And my goal and my prayer is that we would honor marriage, honor the marriage covenant, and we would pursue oneness in Christ with our spouse. So look at man's problem. Look at verse 18. For the first time in the beginning of creation, we find the words, not good. The Lord God said that it was not good that man should be alone. Up until this point, everything God made, the heavens, the earth, the stars in the sky, the land, the waters, all the animals to fill them, was all good. The masterpiece of God's creation, man, whom God formed and fashioned in His likeness, in His image, and breathed the breath of life into Him, was good, was very good. Yet before the end of the sixth day, there was something not good in God's perfect universe that He had made. In spite of having created man perfect, put him in the perfect garden, the paradise where God was present, walking with him, having fellowship with him, meeting all of Adam's needs, there was something lacking, something missing with this man. When was that? God said it was not good for man to be alone. There is something missing when man is by himself. See, God created all of us with this inherent need for companionship, for friendship, for fellowship. Man needs a lifelong companion to share his life with, to share his soul with, to, to love with. Man needs this helper to make up for what he is lacking. I think the most obvious thing here in our context is remember God's divine purpose. Why did God create man? What were the commands given to him? Go, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, exercise dominion over all of it, subdue the earth. He cannot accomplish this on his own. Now, God is saying here, even the perfect man made, no sin, needs deep fellowship by having a wife. And if this perfect man needs a wife, how much more do all of us imperfect men need a spouse, need a wife? Think about how much of us we are dependent upon how our wives complement and supplement us. I was thinking about this even more strongly last, uh, last December when you know, we had James and Liz and James were living with my mom and I was at home watching the other three, you know, getting them up for school, making the lunch, sending them off to school, caring and doing all the stuff that a lot of it my wife does. And like just realizing, man, there's just so much stuff. I am so thankful <laughs> for her help in raising these kids. It is very difficult and tough on your own. Now for Adam, certainly God fulfills all of his vertical needs. But there are still these horizontal relational needs that are designed by God to be met by other people. Wife family, community, our needs for belonging, our needs for relationship and community are given to us by God. It's also reflected in who God is Himself as a triune God, having perfect fellowship, perfect community within the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is a community there. There is intimate and deep fellowship, and our relationships kind of reflect that. Now, this doesn't mean you have to be married. Don't get me saying that, but for the majority of people, God has designed us to have our relational, intimacy, horizontal community needs and fellowship and friendship needs met through marriage. Singleness in the Scriptures is a gift from the Lord. It's a gift where you are content in the Lord and you don't have this recurring urge to be married. 
Many single people have done many great things for the Lord because they just weren't tied down with having family and domestic life. Our Lord Jesus Christ was single. The Apostle Paul, as much far as we know, was single. Maybe he was uh, widowed, to name a few people who have done many great things for the Lord. But let me encourage you, if you're pursuing singleness, meet those relational needs by developing deep life-giving friendships and relationships with other believers so that they can strengthen you to fulfill His plan for you, to meet those needs. So here's man's problem. We need friendships. We need relationship with other people. We need a spouse to be able to fill God's plan for us. That's Adam's need. So what's God's solution in verse 18? 19 and 20. Well, he says, I will make for him a helper fit for him. See, God's solution to man's loneliness problem is to custom create a helper, a companion, perfectly suitable or fit for Adam. This word helper does not imply any kind of inferiority or whatever else we may think about when we think the word helper in our culture. In fact, 16 out of the 19 times this Hebrew word is used in the Bible, it refers to God. God as our helper, and indeed He is our helper, and we do need His help. Psalm 54, 4, Behold, God is my helper, the Lord is the upholder of my life. And I know it's in the New Testament, it's not the same Old Testament Hebrew word, but the Holy Spirit is given the name helper by Jesus in John 14. He helps us. God is our helper. So, helper tells us about the function, what, 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 what one does. It has nothing to say about one's worth or one's value or anything like that. That's something the culture defines, not something that God says. And not just any helper that God provide for Adam, but one that is a good fit, a suitable one to complement, to help, to support Adam. The word suitable or fit here means equal or adequate. Now, although men and women are certainly different, we are different physically, we have different roles, we are both equally of value and worth. We are both equal image bearers of God. We have both equal accountability to God and have a moral responsibility to Him to keep His commands. We see later on we're all equally guilty of disobeying God's commands and also equally recipients of God's grace. See, God knew that the greatest gift outside Himself that He could give to Adam, the perfect man He had created, was to give him a wife custom-made for him, custom-made by him, from him. God knew this, but Adam didn't know it yet. He wasn't aware that he had a problem. He was only made, and perhaps I guess maybe only been alive for mere hours. So what does God do? Well, he does this kind of strange thing in verse 19 and 20. He parades all these different species of animals and birds before Adam to get Adam to name them, really for the point and purpose of helping Adam realize he's missing a woman in his life. So you think about it, every animal that God summons before Adam and, and He names them has a male kind and a female kind. And He has to distinguish, you know, this is a giraffe. This other long-necked animal is also a giraffe, but they are similar, the same species, but they're different, right? One is a male, one is a female giraffe. And then there is you no know, an elephant. No, there's this kind of elephant, and then there's another kind of elephant. There's a male one and a female one. There's, there's a lion, you know, with the bushy mane, that's the male. There's a lioness, female lion. So he's going through all these animals, male, female. He's distinguishing between the different species. He's naming them all. And after naming all of these thousands or millions of different species, Adam gets the point. God, where's my female companion? How come there's only just me? And as an aside, I mean, consider this, just how intelligent, how creative the perfect man God made was. 
I mean, between how many hours that God made him and, 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 and all the other animals, and between the, the, the making of Eve on the sixth day, Adam is able to name every single animal species and bird in mere hours. And not just arbitrarily assign a name, but to observe something special, distinct, characteristic of this animal and name this species this kind of name. I mean, I did some kind of research because I was interested in this. Scientists estimate that there are about 6.5 million species of living animals today, another 2.2 million living in the water, so 8.7 million species, give or take a million. Look, I don't even know that many words to describe different animals. I also Googled this. You know, there are about only one million words in the English language. So my point is saying Adam is far more intelligent than even Google. He's smarter than any AI. And and, and what he's able to do in mere hours is mind-blowing. It should just blow your mind how smart and intelligent this and creative this man is, the perfect man. Now, naming is also a part of exercising God's dominion and authority over all the animals. Naming implies ownership and authority over the thing that you name. God names the day, day, and the night, night. He names Adam, man, Adam. So God owns all the universe. He has authority over it all. God commanded Adam to, to name all the animals, so God has given him authority over all the animals as well. Later on, Adam will name Eve woman to show that God has given him authority over her as well. So so Adam now realizes after naming all the species, he has a problem. He has no fit, suitable helper. He has no female companion. So after he realizes this problem, the Lord in verse 21 causes him to fall into a deep sleep. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up that place with flesh, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So God puts Adam to sleep. And this means that Adam has no part in Adam's creation. He is completely passive in the whole ordeal. And God makes a woman, Eve, from Adam's rib. And notice this. Everything else besides Adam and Eve, God simply just commanded and it became a reality. He just spoke it into existence. But the word here made emphasizes that God had custom-tailored, custom-made Eve for Adam. She was handcrafted. She was custom-made for him. She's a one of one, a unique, a precious, and a precious being of incredible value and incredible worth. And Adam knows that there is none other like her. He has gone through all the other animals and birds that God has made. There is no one else like her. And so she should be treated as such. Precious, custom, delicate, of incredible value and worth. Also notice this, when God made Eve out of Adam's rib... That implies that she is not one of the other creatures that God made for Adam to exercise dominion over. She is quite literally a part of Adam, from the very same substance and essence of Adam. And I kind of love what the the commentator Matthew Henry wrote. He was was alive in the 1600s, 1700s, but he put it this way, and I think it's really helpful just to understand this. The woman was not made out of his head to top him nor out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. I mean, think about that. God could have made Eve out of anything. She chooses a rib. And I love how Matthew Henry has just laid that out. Well, why? So God's solution to man's problem is to give him a wife. Establish the marriage covenant. That's his solution. But I want us to step back and think about what is our culture's solution? What is our culture's solution to loneliness? Well, let me tell you what. It's not the covenant of marriage. Our culture's solution to man's loneliness is the freedom to have unbridled sex with whomever, whenever, with no strings attached. To have as much sexual pleasure as you want and maybe one day 
you'll find the right person to marry. But until that time comes, you know, try it out first, cohabitate, live together, see what eventually works out and tie the knot and get married maybe one day. That's kind of our culture's perspective. In our culture, marriage is an afterthought. Maybe if you want to bring children into the world, get married. Marriage is viewed as restrictive, unnecessary in the eyes of our world. I mean, why would you restrict yourself to just one person for, one, for life? Go experiment. Go experience more while you're young. That's kind of the philosophy of the world. And all the statistics prove it as well. The people who get married, the percentage of people who get married is on the decline almost every single year. I mean, think about, you know, your parents or your grandparents' generation. Practically almost everybody got married and they stayed married. Think about our generation. Well, most people get married. There's a lot more divorce, now, but most people do eventually do get married. Look at our younger generation. It's even less. Very few get married, and the statistics right now, 40 to 50% of marriages do end in divorce. And not only that, you know, three-quarters of those who are younger, younger millennials, Gen Ys, Gen Xers, Alphas, believe that cohabitation, living together, is not just acceptable, but it is the ideal norm to strive for. Not marriage, live together without marriage. More people today have lived together romantically with others than those who have ever been married. No, we're in the minority. We live in an age where fornication or consensual sex outside marriage is the accepted norm. Every movie we watch, every show has the same thing. Marriage is viewed as archaic, restrictive, out of touch, something just to be overthrown. I think a lot of that comes from a selfish understanding of what even is the purpose of marriage. If you ask most people, you know, why do you want to get married? I think a lot of the reason people give is usually it's about my happiness. I always want to get married to make me happy. We even have that saying, right? Happy wife, happy life. Well, it just it tells us that marriage in our culture's understanding is about my personal happiness. That's just how our culture thinks about it. Notice in that definition, there's nothing there about you know, God's purpose or God's design for marriage. God created marriage for fellowship, for companionship, for mutual help and comfort so that we may fulfill God's purpose for us. Here in Genesis 1 and 2, to build a home, to exercise dominion where children can come to know the Lord and be blessed by Him. Marriage is also a means of grace to sanctify us, to make us more holy. When you take two sinful, selfish people and force them to learn how to live together in submission to God and His commands, like He commands us to love one another as God loved us, that forces you to become more Christ-like, to be less selfish, to be less immoral and more Christ-like and holy. Marriage is intended by God as a means for our holiness to help us to be less selfish and self-centered. Back to our text, after seeing Eve for the first time, well, he breaks out, Adam speaks in poetic song. This at last, finally, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Finally, at last, this is the one. This is my soulmate, my friend, my female companion, my wife. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. My, in other words, saying she's my own flesh and my own blood. And notice what Adam does. He names the female God created from his rib, woman, Isha, and man, Ish, man. You now they are related to one another. These words are in relation to each other. The root word of woman means soft. Again, this act of naming demonstrates God has given him authority in the home to care for, to love, to provide, to give himself for his wife. 
Now let's look at the covenant of marriage, verse 24 and 25. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And the man and the wife were both naked and unashamed. The word therefore there helps us to understand that Moses is moving away from just teaching and getting to application. The application of God creating man and woman is for man to to come together in this marriage covenant, which is defined for us in these couple verses. Now, a covenant is more than a contract. It's more than a commitment. A covenant is an unbreakable promise that has some responsibilities and obligations which lead to blessings and rewards. There are also severe consequences for breaking that covenant, that vow. God relates to His people through covenants, right? God only gives Himself freely to those who will enter into a covenant with Him. I think about this, the Abrahamic covenant, for example, Genesis 7, 17. God says to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generation for an everlasting covenant to be their God to you and to be your, to your offspring and after you. I think about this, we also have repeated throughout the scriptures, you know, God reminding us of this covenant, saying to his people who, who, are, or who are of faith, I will be your God and you will be my people. I will be God to all who enter into this covenant by faith, demonstrating it with obedience. I will be your God and you will be my people. So that's how God relates to all of us, through covenants. Now, marriage, then, is a divinely blessed, a lifelong monogamous covenant union between a man and a woman for life before God. Malachi 2.14 says this, But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Right? We see here there's a horizontal relation, the covenant with your spouse, and it demands faithfulness. Proverbs 2.17, speaking about the adulteress, she is the one who has forsaken the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant with her God. So not only is this marriage covenant between two people, but it's also vertically between God and the sight of God. Jesus himself reminds us of God's covenant design for marriage when he rebukes the Pharisees about their unbiblical understanding of divorce, Matthew 19, 5 and 6. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Marriage is a sacred act. It is done in the covenant before the presence of God. God joins two people together. Now, I know what you're saying. You know, verse Genesis 2 doesn't have the word marriage covenant in there, but the concepts are clearly there, repeated for us in the rest of the Scriptures with covenantal language. And here are kind of the three parts of this covenant are leaving, cleaving, or I would say weaving. There's a leaving. There's a separation. There's a forsaking of all others. There's a cleaving. There's a uniting together in a covenant with another. There's a weaving. There's a working out that covenant union let me give you an example of what that is. You know, Israel, when they entered into the covenant with God, they were to what? Leave, forsake all other gods. They were to what? You know, unite exclusively to worship Yahweh as their God alone. And they were to be faithful in working it out, growing, maturing, to be a blessing to all nations. They were supposed to grow. Let's look kind of at these three components. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother. Now, what's in here is not necessarily a physical separation, but this is more of a, a matter of authority and matter of priority separation. Now, in the ancient world, when people got married, they didn't exactly move across town. Most of them just, you know, they built another extension on the home. They pitched another tent on the family land and the property. They were physically not very far away. They didn't move across the oceans to to be married. 
Now, some of you also, likewise, you live with your parents or your in-laws because housing prices in GTA are just crazy and nobody has a million dollars to, or can get a mortgage for that. Believing means that you now put your spouse's welfare and his or her needs above that of your parents. Now understand how remarkable this is in a traditional kind of Jewish society where honoring your parents is the highest human obligation. Honoring your parents is next to honoring God. The leaving of your parents in this regard is such a very striking, it's a radical change. This doesn't mean you stop honoring your parents, but it means there's a radical shift in your priorities, a radical transfer from the authority of your father to that of your husband. Your new priority as a married couple is to put your spouse's interests and his or her needs and his or her desires above the interests of your parents. Your seeking for approval and affirmation is now to be found first in your spouse, above that of your parents. It's not easy. Especially we live in an Asian culture, you know, uh, honoring parents is a big deal. We spend 20, 30 years of our lives seeking to, uh, seek to please and, and make our parents proud of us. Now that has a shift. It's not easy when two people come together because we have different family traditions. And where those differences are, we clash. Let me just encourage you just to do whatever it takes to make your spouse happy above your parents happy if there is a conflict. There doesn't always have to be, but choose to do what is best pleasing to your spouse. We also have a transfer of authority, right? The husband becomes a new head of this family union. And even in our marriage and wedding ceremonies, remember this, you know, who is the one walking the bride down the aisle? Who is the one who is giving the bride away to the future son-in-law? It's the husband most times. I mean, the father most times. Sometimes it's the mother. Sometimes it's together. You know, it depends on the family situation. But in that illustration. It's a picture of the transfer of authority, the transfer of care from father and mother to the new husband. The husband is to use that authority given by God to lead the wife. In Christ-like love and care provision, just like her father cared for her all the years up until that day. The wife is then to submit to her husband's leadership unto the Lord. Not because the husband's always right, but because you trust Him to lead you to follow Christ, just like you trusted your parents to raise you well. Now, broadly speaking, you know, anything not forbidden by scriptures, always seek to agree and side with your spouse. Yes, challenge. Yes, raise up and discuss things. But husbands, consider the opinions of your wives, but wives, submit to your husband's final decision. And not only is there to be a leaving, but there's a cleaving, a holding fast to the wife. Hold fast means to cleave, to stick together, to cling together. It's one of God's most favorite words to describe how He wants His people to interact with Him in in the covenant. To hold fast to Him, to, to, to hold fast to His commandments and His words. To not let any rival gods or any idols compete for your heart, for your love, for your obedience. Now, in the context of marriage, cleaving means I will establish an exclusive monogamous relationship with you, and I will not entertain any other rivals and let anything else compete for my attention, for my eyes, for my heart, my affection, my decision-making, my priorities. It's exclusively yours. Right? We say this in our marriage vows, in our wedding vows. Now, I take you to be my husband. I take you to be my wife. Forsaking all others till death do us part. That's where this comes from. Now, even your next of kin relationships, whether it's parents, whether it's children, they cannot be the center of your life. They cannot be the center of your home. Granted, there are seasons in your life where you have to give a greater priority to raising your kids, especially when they're young. Or if you have elderly parents and you've got to care for them, you know, you've got to skip, give some time and energy and effort over there. But normally, your marriage must take the priority in your home. 
You can't let other things like your career, other interests, even ministry become a rival for your spouse's heart and attention. Look, it's easy to busy yourself with your job and your work that neglect the most important relationship in your life because you spend the most hours at work. It's easy to let even good things like ministry, serving God, take priority away from your marriage. I've got to tell you this. Every single Christian ministry is always in need of more volunteers and help. <laughs> that is never going to be a way. There's never going to be a lack. of. We we'll say, we, we got this. We're all perfect. We don't need any more help. There's always going to be a need to meet. But I think the Bible is also very clear what the priority must be. That you have to manage your own household first and get that in order first before you serve in any kind of significant, meaningful, visible leadership way. I don't mean just helping out here and there, but like if you're going to take a job title, if you're going to be serving in a visible way, the biblical requirement for an elder, for a deacon, is to have your house in order. Not perfect, but in order. Whatever it is that lets, becomes a rival in your home, that is what's going to create dysfunction in your home. And if you have that dysfunction in your home, you can't live up to what God intends for you, how He wants to bless you. Because outside your relationship with God, He wants your marriage to be the main priority in your life. So weave, leave, cleave, weave, right? And the two will become one flesh. The weaving of a husband and a wife to be united together in one flesh. Two souls becoming one. Two hearts becoming one heart. The big biblical basis for this, again, is God being a three distinct person, Trinity God, becoming one, being one God. Right? The goal of marriage is for two people who have lived separate lives to become so intertwined that you can no longer separate them back to two. Now, the first implication of this becoming one flesh is obviously physically through sexual intimacy. The context here is pretty clear. Adam cannot fulfill his creation mandate to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth without Eve, without sex. God designed sex to be one way, one way that married couples grow deeper in intimacy and oneness with each other. Sex is not the only way to have deep intimacy and find fulfillment in life, so anyone who has that gift of singles will tell you otherwise that you can be fulfilled as a single person as well. But if you don't have that God-given ability, that gifting to be content as a single person, to abstain from sex, that's a very strong indication that you should pursue marriage. Pursue marriage. Because the Bible is unequivocally clear. Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus, Paul, any kind of sexual act outside that marriage covenant is sin. If you're going to fool around with somebody who's not your spouse, you're going to cohabitate together with someone who's not your spouse, the Bible is clear. That is sinful. It is destructive to you. It is dishonoring to God and Christ. It does not lead to a healthy relationship with God or to your spouse or, or to the person, you're, I mean, the person you're being intimate with. Sin always separates. But like any sin... Sexual sin must be repented of. It must be forsaken. Like any sin, sexual sin can find forgiveness only in Christ. Right? Because Christ died for sinners who will confess their sins, who will repent of sin, who will stop and turn away and change their mind and turn away from sin. It's no good to, you know, to say sorry and then keep on sinning. You must leave and have a separation from sin and turn away from it to find forgiveness from God. But I find sexual sins also carry this particularly heavy burden of guilt and shame and condemnation. I think because it involves and violates so, something that's so intimate and so intimate about you and that other person. But if you have that guilt and that shame, it's also a good thing. It's also necessary because guilt and shame is what will drive you to come and find relief from Christ, to find grace and mercy in Christ. Let that guilt and shame drive you to repentance. 
so Christ can come into your life and lift up that burden of guilt from you, remove it from you as far as the east is from the west. As we sung this morning, only Jesus can save and rescue and restore us into our right relationship with Him and with each other. Right? Just like Jesus said to that woman whom the the Pharisees and the people brought before Him saying she was caught in adultery. They're saying, you know, the Bible, the law says we should stone her. What should you say, Jesus? And Jesus, you know, starts, you know, drawing in the floor. I don't know what He was drawing, maybe the sins of the people. And He kind of said this, you know, you who was without sin, cast the first stone. Right? And everyone, you know, recognized that, you know, they have sinned, so they all kind of left, and eventually there was nobody there. That mob that came to stone her was gone. And what does Jesus tell her? That woman caught in adultery for I don't know how many times. Go and sin no more. Right? Repentance is that. Stop and break that pattern of sin and turn back to the Lord. And only Jesus can restore your rescue. He can purify you. He can sanctify whatever mess that you've got yourself in, whatever that is in your past. Christ can wash it all away and cleanse you and restore you to Him and to others. But becoming one flesh is more than just being sexually intimate. It's also two selfish people learning how to think as one, how to live as one. How we can have two hearts become one heart. How two people who are yoked together can pull and drive and move in the same direction. Right? It's not like yoked together. You know, you're kind of like yoked in, in the carriage. You can't be going this way and that way and expect you know, want to be going kind of this way together in life. It's two people sharing one of everything. One life. One spirit. One reputation, one bed, one budget, one family, one mission in life, one direction, one suffering. When one suffers, the other suffers. It's also being naked and unashamed, having no barriers, no guilt, no hiding, no justification of each other, no abusing, no body shaming, complete, total openness and solidarity with your spouse until death do you part. Marriage is about oneness. Let me state this also. You cannot be one with someone who doesn't share the same values as you, the same visions as you, the same direction and purpose and priority in your life. In other words, you cannot achieve this oneness if you marry someone who's not sharing the same faith as you. Because where do we derive our values, our vision, direction, and purpose? It's all from our faith. Right? Besides the fact that God explicitly commands us not to marry someone outside the faith. Because in all the areas that you are not one in, you are not on the same page, those are going to be the areas that you will fight over. Those are going to be the areas in your life where you may compromise your faith in. Life purpose church ministry involvement, how you're going to raise your kids in the church, outside the church, how you'll spend your money, how you'll budget, how's your unbelieving wife going to feel or, or spouse going to feel about tithing and offering, pursuing God together. But in all of these areas where you are one in, these are not going to be the places we're going to have a lot of fights in. You're already in agreement and in alignment together and all these important things. You're pushing and, and going in the same direction already. There's nothing really major to fight about. There might be minor things, but you're not going to have big fights about you know, whether I should go to church or not if your, friend, if your spouse is a believer, right? Don't buy that notion that the world tells you opposites attract. Buy into God's wisdom that marriage is about oneness. The more one you are, the stronger your marriage is going to be. The more you're going to be able to glorify God and fulfill whatever purpose He has for you in your home. So if you're single, let me just give you some practical wisdom to encourage you to prepare yourself to get married while you're still younger. 
while there's still less of you to kind of shave off in order to become one with your spouse. The younger you get married, the less years of accumulation of different kinds of baggage you have when you enter into that marriage covenant. And the more time you can spend in your impressionable years building oneness with your spouse. Well, some tips on how to cultivate oneness. Well, it's not any rocket science. Pray together. Read the scriptures together. Talk and spend quality time together. That's how you build oneness. I need to do that more too in my life. And if you guys have better tips, you know, please feel free to share and discuss and let me know as well. So let's kind of bring us to all the conclusion. God made marriage. It's his grand idea to bless people that he made in his image. Yet our human marriages are ultimately still a picture of the gospel. A review of marriage reveals Christ's unconditional saving and sanctifying love for his bride, the church. Think about this. Before Christ even chose his bride, he knows all of her sinful blemishes, all of her impurities, all of her past adulterous relationships with the world and idols and other gods, yet Jesus still says, I want her. I'm going to make her mine. I'm going to love her. I'm going to die for her. I'm going to sanctify her. I'm going to cleanse her, wash her, present her pure and holy, blameless, spotless before me on my wedding day. That's the whole basis of what the Apostle Paul exhorts us to be as Christians. Christian husbands to love our wives this way. Christian wives to submit to your own husband this way in Ephesians chapter 5. Biblical marriage is about our holiness, not just our personal happiness. You see, when a believer marries another believer, (laughs) and we continue to pursue each other, sanctification and our holiness, in spite of all the blemishes and the flaws and different pasts and upbringings that we discover along the way, we put on display for the world to help them see through our marriage what God is like in His unconditional, saving, sanctifying love for His church. How He doesn't expose our guilt and our shame, but He covers our nakedness, our guilt and our shame. We reveal to the world when we do this how we can be image bearers of God. We're proclaiming to the world what an amazing Savior we have. Whether you're single, you're married, you're widowed, you're separated, if you are a believer in Christ, you are presently engaged to the Lord Jesus Christ. This whole life we have until His return is preparing ourselves for the wedding ceremony. When He comes back and consummates the marriage with His church, and in that day, all of us all of us will be completely spotless and blameless and sinless. The sanctification that work God has been begun in us will be perfected. We will shine with radiant glory as a bride prepares to meet her glorious husband, Jesus Christ, on our wedding day. To God is at work in everything. He's making all things new. He's going to come back and fix everything wrong with this world, recreate a new paradise that we may spend with Him forever. He's going to fix every sin and remove it from us forever so we can live and dwell with Him forever. This is the hope that Jesus brings to all who have come to Him by faith doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what's in your past, what you have been, where you have found yourself. Jesus says to you, I want you. I lived a perfect life, and I've given that to you. I have died on the cross for you to wash you of all your sins. I have raised from myself from the grave to give you eternal life that you can spend with me forever. The only question is, will you come? 
Will you receive what he's done for you in faith? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time. We can just come before your word and how you have given us this blessing of marriage. Lord, we pray that you, know, you would help us to honor marriage, to lift it up, to exalt this covenantal institution, this great relationship that you have given to us, which reveals a picture of how much you love your church. Lord, help us to grow in our marriages. Help us to pursue oneness with one another and in Christ. Help us to push and go in the same direction towards greater and greater holiness and Christ-likeness and forgive us. Help us to turn. Help us to repent of any sin that hinders us along the way and pursue those who have not yet come and bend the knee to you. Seek and save the lost among us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.